Hi, this is John Linnebell from John Linnebell Tutoring, and this is AP US History Video 59, Reconstruction Comes and Goes. Let's move on. Reconstruction's limited success and serious setbacks. Reconstruction succeeded in the short run, but was mostly undone in the long run. The Union was reconstructed and black former slaves were given the chance to participate in the political process, including being elected to political office. As Reconstruction continued, executive power took a backseat to congressional power. Reconstruction's success did not last long, mostly because the Republican Party was not able to establish itself as a serious alternative to the Democratic Party in the former Confederate states. This, in turn, was probably due to a lack of cultural change in the South. The same racial and cultural attitudes in most voters meant that the same political practices continued in the South. Resistance by Southerners who didn't want to change society and the lack of will to enforce social and political change by Northerners meant nothing changed. Makes sense, right? And here's a little thing about the 15th Amendment. Anyway, let's move on. Different tactics and strategies used in Reconstruction. As the Civil War was ending, Lincoln and the Republican Party started to address issues regarding how the post-war world should be constructed. Some of the questions included, how would the people of the South be reintegrated into the Union? And how would those who rebelled against the Union, that is the people who fought for and or supported the Confederacy, be treated? Would they be tried for treason? Who would be responsible for arranging for the reorganization of society and punishing wrongdoing, the executive or the legislative branch? One major question was, did the Confederacy essentially commit suicide by seceding, meaning they no longer existed as political entities, or were they the same states they ever were, just needing new leadership as Lincoln believed? What I personally believe is it doesn't make sense to destroy an entire state's political structure to start a new one unless it's completely rotten and corrupt. People really don't like changes like that unless most people really hate the state government, which usually isn't the case. They really don't like radical change that's imposed on by outsiders. So, for example, Germany in World War I, they really hated the things that were imposed on them. It's better to keep things the same if they can. So, you know, you can think about the World War II occupation of Japan. They didn't make the emperor resign or step down. And a lot of it was kept the same, even though a lot of things were changed. In the fiction world, you can watch the TV series on Amazon, The Man in the High Castle, or actually go read the book. And, you know, there you can see, well, okay, this is a fictional, a fictional account of a world where the Allies lost World War II. So the U.S. is occupied by Nazi Germany and Japan. And you can see, okay, they kept the Statue of Liberty, but now they've put, you know, the German, <laughs> kind of German Nazi things on there. And you can't see it here, but the arm where she's holding the torch is now basically the uh, Lady Liberty is now giving the Nazi salute, etc. So the idea is, you know, in that fictional thing, they kept things basically as much as it had been before, because otherwise people would just get all riled up and it would be much harder to govern this society. But I digress. Radical Republicans believed that the Southern secessionist states had committed suicide and therefore had to be readmitted to Congress. The questions above were the basis of the difference of opinion between the various factions of the Republican Party and others involved in Reconstruction, such as Democrats, etc. Reconstruction starts during the war. Obviously, Lincoln wanted to reunite the Union as soon as possible. It was the reason for the war. One preliminary goal was to restore Southern representation in Congress. Lincoln unveiled his 10% plan in 1863. The plan was that if 10% of the 1860 vote count in a Confederate state took an 
oath of loyalty to the Union and agreed to respect emancipation, that state could start a new government and send representatives and senators to Congress. This was an easy standard for the Confederate states to meet. In 1864, Lincoln vetoed the Wade-Davis bill, which would have established a much tougher standard for Confederate states' readmission to the Union. 50% of the electorate would have to sign a loyalty oath before readmission, and former states would, not former states, I'm sorry, former slaves would have to be guaranteed equal treatment. In 1865, Lincoln announced in his second inaugural address that his goal was to reunite the Union with malice to none, with charity to all. This made sense since Lincoln always intended to end the war as quickly as possible. Generally, that's good policy. War is expensive and dangerous and causes problems. How unfortunately, unfortunately, Lincoln was assassinated less than a month after his inaugural address, so no one will ever know how Lincoln would have handled Reconstruction and its problems. Reconstruction by the President. After Lincoln was shot, Andrew Johnson, the vice president, took over for Lincoln. Johnson was selected as vice president because he refused to leave his Senate seat when Tennessee, his home state, seceded in 1861. Although Johnson didn't support the planter class in Tennessee, he also wasn't a fan of the Republican Party or emancipation or even equality for African Americans. Johnson continued with the fast and lax approach to Reconstruction that Lincoln planned. Johnson swiftly recognized the new southern state governments after they met the loyalty oath requirements and ratified the 13th Amendment. So remember, that was really only about 10% of the state's electorate had to sign a loyalty oath. Let's move on. Reconstruction by the President. Unfortunately, many of the same people chosen to run the former Confederate states governments were former slave owners. Obviously, the former slave owners wanted to ensure the former slaves were as close to still being slaves as possible. Here's the who to weigh in on that one. To that end, the state governments enacted the Black Codes, much like the Slave Codes, which we'll discuss next, that existed during official slavery. We're going to be discussing the Black Codes, not the Slave Codes as much. Anyway, the New South was so like the Old South that Union supporters questioned if the North had won the war but lost the peace. And now here's a little commentary from the late, great George Carlin, my favorite comedian of all time. So anyway, about 80 years after the Constitution is ratified, 80 years later, the slaves are freed. Not so you'd really notice it, of course. Just sort of on paper. And that was, of course, during the Civil War. Now there's another phrase I dearly love. That is a true oxymoron if I've ever heard one. Civil War. Do you think any country could really have a civil war? <laughs> Say, pardon me. <laughs> I'm awfully sorry. Black codes. So what were black codes? Were they special language that non-blacks couldn't understand? Nope. Good guess, though. The Black Codes were laws the former Confederate states passed right after the Civil War in 1865 and 1866. Mississippi was the first state to enact the Black Codes in 1865, quickly followed by the remaining 10 other former Confederate states. These laws were intended to regulate the conduct of former slaves and to essentially reconstruct the socioeconomic conditions of the antebellum South, so the pre-war South, you know, that is when slavery existed. Some black codes prohibited African-Americans from owning land or businesses. 
Now, that doesn't sound at all like slavery, does it? Note the sarcasm there. It sounds exactly like slavery. Slavery, I can talk. Anyway, vagrancy laws were also central features of the Black Codes. Newly freed black slaves found they could be arrested and harshly punished for minor offenses. For example, many states' black codes made it illegal for a person to be on a public road without a minimum amount of money. A common punishment for a black code infraction was the convicts being sentenced to work on a plantation for a certain time. The radical Republicans in Congress, I know radical Republican sounds a little silly these days, but back then the Republicans were pretty radical and they weren't radical in the way today's Republicans are. But I digress. Radical Republicans in Congress found the whole situation objectionable and ushered in a tougher program of reconstruction overriding the vetoes of President Johnson. The 13th Amendment bans slavery or does it? Okay, the 13th Amendment was the constitutional amendment that banned slavery by saying that involuntary servitude, that is being a servant, you know, having to work for somebody involuntarily, you know, so that means you were forced to do it, you don't have a choice, is illegal in the United States. However, there's an exception for involuntary servitude as punishment of a crime or for a crime. And that's fine, but that's not really slavery per se. I mean, somebody who's in prison, yeah, you can order them to do some work. I mean, for example, you might say you have to clean up your cell. Well, technically that would be involuntary servitude, but you could see that being something that's pretty reasonable and necessary to run the prison. But a lot of this stuff goes too far, as we'll discuss in a little bit here. Anyway, at least one history professor has said, well, no, the 13th Amendment is neutral and it's by itself, it's not perpetuating slavery by allowing involuntary servitude for the punishment of a crime to exist. It's just something that's necessary to make incarceration possible. So the reason he says that is because, well, there were other things, you know, the black codes, sharecropping, etc. Those really were the systems that were really oppressive rather than just saying, okay, you, you know, if you end up in prison, you're probably going to have to do some work whether you want to or not. So we're going to discuss this a little bit further and you can make your mind up over it. Is prison labor fair? Incarcerated workers generate billions of dollars worth of goods and services annually, but are paid pennies per hour without proper training or opportunity to build skills for careers after release, according to a nationwide report released by the University of Chicago Law School's Global Human Rights Clinic and the American Civil Liberties Union. This report, Captive Labor, exploitation of incarcerated workers examines the use of prison labor throughout the U.S. and highlights how incarcerated workers labor provides prison maintenance services in addition to crucial public services. So basically, if they have something that needs to be maintained at a prison, which is going to be lots and lots of things, these are huge buildings or complexes of buildings, Instead of having to hire many, many maintenance workers and construction workers and what have you, they have the prisoners do it. And in addition, there are public services, all sorts of things, you know, road work, forestry, blah, 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 that these people do. And they're not paid very much to do it because, hey, they're in prison and they basically don't have a choice. So this report, which we'll call Captive Labor for short, also strongly supports extensive reforms to prison labor to make it actually voluntary and ensure the incarcerated workers are paid fairly, properly trained, and taught job skills prisoners can use after release. Clinical professor Claudia 
Flores, the director of the Global Human Rights Clinic, states, as our report describes in detail, the label, labor, sorry, labor conditions of incarcerated workers in many U.S. prisons violate the most fundamental human rights to life and dignity. In other words, in any other workplace, these conditions would be shocking and plainly unlawful. The many incarcerated workers we interviewed told us story after story of inadequate equipment and training, punishments doled out if workers refuse to labor, and an overall helplessness to a government institution functioning as both jailer and boss. So imagine if your boss at work got to jail you and punish you if they didn't like the work you did. It's pretty scary, huh? The main findings include nearly two-thirds, 65%, so two-thirds would be 66.6%. .6%. Anyway, of incarcerated people report working while in prison, so that's roughly 800,000 incarcerated workers. Over three quarters of incarcerated people surveyed, 66%, so just a little over three quarters, report being punished for refusing to work, such as solitary, solitary, not solitary, solitary confinement, no time off for good behavior, or denial of family visitation. Well, that's pretty bad. Solitary confinement itself is pretty close to. Torture, no time off for good behavior. Well, that means you have to serve the whole sentence if you never get time off for good behavior. And denial of visit, you know, visitation from your family, that's just terrible. Imprisoned workers can't control work assignments, have no minimum wage or overtime protections, can't unionize, don't receive adequate training or equipment, and have no workplace safety guarantees, even in dangerous working conditions. So consequently, 64% of imprisoned workers surveyed report worrying about their workplace safety. 70% of them say they were given no formal job training. 70% report having insufficient funds for basic needs such as soap and phone calls with prison labor wages. It says 30 minutes. Yep. We were out here for four hours. You were on your phone. You know the rules when you signed up. But I collected more garbage than anybody out here. I have to be able to conduct business to earn a living. No. What do you mean, no? Think of community services your jail time. No phones allowed in jail. Come on, 30 minutes, that's, that's not right. You can do better than that. We could make it zero. And at least $2 billion worth of goods and $9 billion worth of prison maintenance services are produced by prison labor annually. But since those figures, they're not really carefully recorded, they could and probably are much higher. U.S. prison labor's programs violate fundamental human rights, as the new report finds. So there's the URL for it, and basically the whole point of this is under the 13th Amendment, involuntary servitude is still perfectly legal if it's a punishment for a crime, but maybe it shouldn't be. So let's move on to the next thing here. And here's the next part of Is Prison Labor Fair? Most states pay incarcerated workers pennies per hour for their work. Seven states, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Texas, pay actually nothing for practically all the work that inmates perform in prison. On average, other states pay something between 15 and 52 cents per hour for non-industry jobs. It is common for prison laborers to see about 80% of their paycheck be withheld for taxes. Well, it says up to 80%, but anyway, a lot for you know taxes, in quotes, room and board expenses, and court costs. That's pretty common that 
prisons and jails, etc., are going to say, well, you have to pay for the cost of your imprisonment, so we're going to take that out of your employment while you are incarcerated. And considering you're only getting paid, let's say, 52 cents per hour, that's not much. I mean, it's almost not even worth collecting, you would think, as the state, but, but I digress. The labor conditions of incarcerated workers in many U.S. prisons violate the most fundamental human rights to life and dignity. And that's Professor Flores from the University of Chicago. The U.S. has a long problematic history of using incarcerated workers as a source of cheap labor and to subsidize the costs of our bloated prison system, says Jennifer Turner principal human rights researcher with the UC, not the UC, the ACLU, not UCLA, ACLU, American Civil, Civil Liberties Union, Human Rights Program. Incarcerated workers are stripped of even the most minimal protections against labor exploitation and abuse. They're paid pennies for their work, even as they produce billions of dollars for states and the federal government. It's past time we treat incarcerated workers with dignity. If the states and federal government can afford to incarcerate 1.2 million people, they can afford to pay them fairly for their work. And that's really the point is, should people who are in prison for whatever reason really not be paid fairly? That doesn't seem right to me. And it sounds a lot like yeah, sounds a lot like involuntary servitude, which is supposed to be illegal, but that's why they're doing it. Oh, well, this is punishment for a crime. So the exploitation of incarcerated workers is rooted in the exception clause of the 13th Amendment, which bars slavery except for people who have been convicted of crimes. In many states and in the U.S. Constitution, the exception clauses allow for workers in prison to be exploited, underpaid, and excluded from workplace protection, you know, safety protection laws. Worse, the exception clause in the 13th Amendment disproportionately encouraged the criminalization and re-enslavement of black people during the Jim Crow era, which is kind of what we're talking about here. And we still feel the impacts of the systemic racism to this day in the disproportionate incarceration of black and brown community members. To combat the exploitation of incarcerated workers, the report makes several recommendations, including ensuring all prison work is fully voluntary by eliminating laws and policies that punish incarcerated people who cannot or will not work, allowing imprisoned workers labor protections identical to those afforded to non-prison workers in the United States, including minimum wage, health and safety standards, unionization, anti-discrimination protection, and quick access to legal remedies when their rights are violated. Institute comprehensive safety and training programs for all prison work assignments. Invest in correctional facility work programs that provide incarcerated workers with marketable skills and training that will help them to find employment after release and eliminate barriers to employment after the release and to amend the U.S. Constitution to abolish the 13th Amendment's exclusion that allows slavery and involuntary servitude as punishment for a crime. You can find this uh, at the URL for the University of Chicago's Human Rights, Global Human Rights, uh, institute that is on the, it will be in the description below when you are looking at this video. I've paraphrased it except for the things that are in quotes. Anyway, it's worth looking at. And another thing that's worth um, doing is listening to the podcast that I also cite to that discuss, uh, it discusses the use of prison labor and it's done by NPR, and it's wonderful, and, you know, while it's horrible that these things are happening, they do a very nice job of explaining. There was one guy who was in prison, worked for a company called Oriental Trading Company, something like that, and while he worked there and performed things in prison, as soon as he got out and applied with the same company to do basically the same job, they said, oh, no, we don't hire felons. Really? 
Anyway, it's worth looking at. So let's move on to the next thing here. Virginia's Vagrancy Act of 1866. My source for this is the Encyclopedia of Virginia entry that is going to be linked in the description below. On January 9, 1866, the House of Delegates passed the act providing for the punishment of vagrants with the Senate of Virginia following suit six days later. The law couldn't be vetoed by Virginia's Republican Governor Francis H. Pierpont as Virginia's governor had no such power, had no veto power. The preamble stating the law's purpose states, there hath lately been a great increase of idle and disorderly persons in some parts of this commonwealth, presumably referring to slavery's abolition, of which moved a significant portion of the state's large African-American population away from their former homes on plantations. Since there was no similar influx of displaced whites in Virginia, the vagrancy law was almost certainly meant to apply mostly to former slaves. The preamble further declares, unless this law is passed, Virginia, in quotes, will be overrun with dissolute and abandoned characters. The, in quotes, solution to this problem was to authorize judges and overseers of the poor to arrest vagrants and have them work, in quotes, for any term not exceeding three months and, in quotes, for the best wages that can be procured for the use of the vagrant or his family. Hey, sounds pretty good. You want to make sure they have a job, right? Well, read on. However, if employed by vagrants... Well, if employed, rather, the vagrants should, without sufficient cause, flee the forced labor, the law imposed harsh penalties. The vagrants would be sent back to their employers where they would work for free, while they would also be retained for an extra month in balls and chains. If all employers wouldn't employ the vagrants, they said, nah, 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 you know, the original employer says, eh, we don't want him back, and the other employers who are hiring vagrants says, eh, we don't want him either, then the vagrants would be forced to work, still unpaid, on public projects and still in balls and chains. Absent public projects, uh, you know, if there's no public projects that would be appropriate for these vagrants, the vagrants who didn't have private employers would be jailed and fed only bread and water. So, very, very strong push to get these vagrants to either work for private employees, employers, I should say, to work for private employers for pay. And if they tried to run away, well, then they'd end up working with private employers without pay. And if that didn't work out, they'd end up working on public works for free, again, with a ball and chain. And if that didn't work, they would just end up in jail, you know, being incarcerated and having lots and lots of lovely bread and water to eat. Not good. The precedence to the Vagrancy Act of 1866 didn't provide for wearing balls and chains. So the laws that existed before the Vagrancy Act of 1866 that looked sort of like it did not require people who were imprisoned to wear balls and chains. In this case, the vagrants who had escaped forced labor, but who eventually got caught, were treated like convicted felons hired to work on public projects or for private employers. That is, they would be put in a ball and chain. In, yeah. So anyway, the law, which allowed predominantly white groups of men to hire out predominantly black vagrants to private employers, must have reminded Virginians of a legal practice from the era of slavery, namely allowing counties and cities to, in quotes, enslave freed African Americans who owed back taxes by forcing them to work as though they were enslaved in order to pay the back taxes. 
So let's move on. Application of the Virginia Vagrancy Act of 1866. Nine days after the Vagrancy Act was passed, Alfred H. Terry, the commanding general of the U.S. Army in Virginia, forbade by public proclamation the enforcement of the law by civil and military officials in Virginia. The proclamation, effective January 24, 1866, attempted to contextualize the law. General Terry's objection to the law was that presumably white employers would pay former slave wages that were, in quotes, below the real values of their labor and far below the prices formerly paid by masters for labor performed by their slaves. The result would be the normalization of, in quotes, vagrants being paid, again, in quotes, wages utterly inadequate to the support of themselves and families. Chris Rock has a little bit to say here. Well, before I started comedy, I used to work at McDonald's making minimum wage. Do you know what it means when somebody pays you minimum wage? You know what your boss was trying to say? It's like, hey, if I could pay you less, I would. <laughs> but it's against the law. The Vagrancy Act, Terry wrote, would artificially lower wages by forcing freedmen to accept employment, even if no conspiracy to lower wages existed per se, the temptation to form them because of the Vagrancy Act will be too strong to resist. Terry declared the ultimate effect of the statute will be to reduce the freedmen to a condition of servitude worse than that from which they have been emancipated, a condition which will be slavery in all but its name. Terry's conclusions caused some white Virginians to deny the Vagrancy Act was intended to apply only to blacks, probably to erase the image of the slave hiring the editor of the Richmond Daily Dispatch opined in an editorial, in fact, the Vagrancy Act is applicable to all persons without distinction of color. We have seen white men convicted of vagrancy under the old law and publicly hired out. It is unknown whether many overseers of the poor and justices of the peace defied Terry and attempted to enforce the law, or whether if they did, the army intervened. The law may have resulted in the arrest of some free slaves, but its larger consequence was related to public opinion. Terry's proclamation drew national press coverage to the situation of freed slaves in Virginia. This likely contributed to con the congressional belief that all freedom for formerly enslaved people could not be entrusted to public officials in the states of the former Confederacy where restrictive laws were known as the Black Codes and were regularly being passed. So there you have it. That's actually pretty amazing when a general in the army is more liberal than officials in the state that they're occupying. But even the General Terry was like, uh, this is not good. You are treating these people like slaves. You're actually treating them worse when they were officially slaves. So I'm going to say, go General Terry, go. Pretty cool guy. All right, let's move on. And while this probably won't be in your AP history, it's worth also looking at the idea of workfare. These cartoons seem to be from the UK, as you can tell from the pound sign, not the dollar sign. So, workfare, it means people like you are forced to do unpaid work for up to six months. Workfare gives those with millions more millions by forcing people to work for no wages. Multi-million pound companies such as Asda, I believe that's a grocery store, McDonald's, Greg's, Primark, and Holiday Inn, use workfare to replace paid labor. 
they now can get staff for free, so why hire them? So this is the same thing. It's basically people who are on public aid. A lot of times they're forced to work because, hey, you're getting benefits. You know, you're getting benefits, so we should make you work for free to pay off the benefits. The trouble is, is a lot of the time the workfare is much, much cheaper than actually paying people. So, for example, workfare depresses wages for people who perform the same job. For example, New York City subway and bus cleaners, you know, there's a problem here. Um, and closer to home, at least closer to my home, San Francisco Muni, the municipal railway that runs the, the little trains and the buses, uh, they got about $14 to $27 per hour, whereas welfare recipients got $5.25 cents per hour and that was back in 1997 so we can see that a lot of these people who are on general assistance that is basically welfare are ending up being forced to do jobs that would pay them a lot more if they were just hired on as normal employees that's not fair that kind of sounds also a little bit like involuntary servitude to me but I believe there have been cases about that, and I don't think that's the way the U.S. Supreme Court looks at it. I don't know. I don't have a valid bar license, so if you need to know, you shouldn't rely on what I say. But that is something that also looks like involuntary servitude to me. So it's something you want to watch out for. All right, let's move on to the next thing. And here is some more on Workfare. Workfare, you can look it up, uh, the Wikipedia entry for it here, which you can see. And it also will be in the description below. A academics have labeled Workfare as a form of institutional or systemic racism. For example, sociologist Lok Wakant. I'm sorry if I butchered that pronunciation, but anyway... You can look that up and Jeff Manza, Jeff Manza probably. Anyway, so basically minorities tend to be poorer, thus need welfare more likely. Thus, when you're being forced to work for, in quotes, workfare, chances are it's kind of like, if it is not exactly, it's close to involuntary servitude for members of minority groups. Clinton era, that is 1996, welfare reform was punitive towards single mothers, etc. And the 1994 crime bill, sponsored by now President Joe Biden, it shrunk workfare, which you might say, oh, that's good, but it increased prison fare. So see the 13th documentary that we discussed above. It's like, oh, let's just out of the frying pan into the fire that... Oh, that's okay. We won't make you get workfare, but when you end up in prison because you probably don't have a job and you're probably going to have to do something pretty desperate, oh, good, you can get prison fare. So something to think about. This is a reason you should care about what happens in your U.S. history classes because history tends to repeat itself. These are things that matter. Do pay attention. All right, and there's... Info is from the UK Fact Boycott Workfare. Did you find this video useful? Please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why? It's really simple. YouTube doesn't let me share any ad revenue unless I have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours. That's 240,000 minutes of view time in a year. While many people are watching these videos, I don't have 4,000 hours of watch time in the last year. I do, however, have 1,000 subscribers, actually more than 1,000 subscribers at this time. So thank you so much to everyone who actually helped me out by subscribing. Ad money will help me make more of these videos. And speaking of ad money, if you've seen an ad during this video or my other videos, please know that I did not get any of the ad money and I won't until I have the subscribers and view time that YouTube demands. For the same reasons, you are not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I gladly read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos that are also constructive. I reserve the right to delete comments such as troll posts or spam for obvious reasons. Nobody likes trollers and spam. You can hire me for tutoring. We can do it online through Zoom or some other similar internet 
platform, or we can meet in person. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, so if you're around there, it's pretty easy for me to come see you. I do travel to other cities sometimes, so you can always contact me and ask me if I'm going to be in your city, and that's another way that I might be able to meet with you in person. Thanks for watching, and my contact information follows. You can contact me on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Linnaball Tutoring, all one word. Instagram, it's instagram.com forward slash John dot Linnaball dot tutoring. And the phone number, this is my cell phone, 415-623-4251. You can always call me or leave a text message. Email, you can always email me at john at johnlinnaball.com. Website, you can reach me at johnlinnaball.com or johnlinnaballtutoring.com. They take you to the same website. And you can also find me at testpreparation.locals.com and at lbry.tv at johnlinnaballtutoring. That's a nifty little site, lbry.tv. My actual postal mail address is John Linnaball Tutoring at 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. And finally, please note this video is not a substitute for your classes, etc., or the text or anything else. This video is based on Barron's AP U.S. History Review Book, the 4th edition. Some of them it's the 5th edition. Anyway or any other sources used in the video description and my general knowledge of U.S. history. While these videos should all help you do well on the AP U.S. history exam, I can't be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about on his or her own tests, homework, etc. Please, please, please read your class texts and please pay attention to what your teacher says in class because that will help you do well on the tests and homework etc that are not the actual AP US history exam all right have a nice day companies states added 50 million extra acres to